Coming up on Talking Points, the former president has been floating an expansive list of names to be his potential VP pick, who we could see join Trump on his campaign. And Florida is coming closer and closer to the enactment of the state's six week abortion ban. How healthcare providers are reacting. Plus, a phone call between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu. Let the two leaders discuss that and more. Talking Point starts right now. New York Appeals Court has denied Donald Trump's petition to change the venue of his upcoming hush money trial. In a last-ditch effort to avert his Manhattan trial, former President Donald Trump's legal team filed a notice of appeal earlier today. Welcome into Talking Points, I'm Benjamin Schiller. And I'm Olivia Maniscalco. The filing, essentially an appeal in the form of a lawsuit, came just one week before his trial was set to begin. Now his lawyers have tried several times to delay it, but this was the first time in an appeals court. It's the latest effort to stop this Manhattan case. It'll be the first prosecution of a former U.S. president and possibly Trump's only case to make it to trial this year. This comes as Trump is also calling on Judge Version to remove himself from the case. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg argued that it was too late for Trump's lawyers to make this to make this position this close to the start of the trial. He said that the correct process for Trump would be to renew a request for a change of venue if it appears they cannot seat a fair jury. We'll talk about some more national news. Texas will continue to bus immigrants pouring across its border sanctuary cities, quote, until we get a new president. Those are words directly from Texas Governor Greg Abbott earlier this week. His comments came during his keynote address at the New York Republican Party's annual gala. This was also a response to criticism by New York City Mayor Eric Adams on how Abbott has been handling the migrant situation. Roughly 180,000 legal immigrants have arrived in New York City since 2022. It's been overwhelming city resources. It's estimated that over 100,000 of them have been busted in from Texas. Moving out west, a congressional race in California could look very different from the rest as two candidates are poised to tie for second place. Typically, only the top two finishers in the state will advance to the general election, but Democrats Evan Lowe and Joe Simichan each got 16.6 .6 of the vote. They will both have their names on the ballot along with fellow Democrat Sam Licardo unless a voter requests a recount. But in doing so, they have some associated costs, and by that, as much as $325,000. Now to Capitol Hill, we've seen this film before. Today, Congress returned from their two-week recess, but Republican infighting threatens to strip House Speaker Mike Johnson of his gavel. Talking Points analyst Ben Vasek is here to break down Johnson's aid package and growing Republican tensions. Ben? Thanks, Olivia. Johnson is struggling to put together a foreign aid package for Ukraine, Taiwan, and Israel that satisfies a restless GOP base. Any aid to Ukraine will require a large amount of Democratic votes, and if Johnson hopes to get his package across the finish line, including aid for Israel will be difficult. Democrats have become more supportive of attaching conditions to Israeli aid following the IDF airstrike last week that killed seven World Central Kitchen aid workers in Gaza. Johnson's solution? breaking up the package into more manageable pieces so lawmakers can vote on each element separately. This move allows Democrats to vote on the $60 billion allocated for Ukraine and Republicans to vote for aid to Israel, even if they don't support the, the additional Ukraine money. Johnson also considered converting a portion of the Ukraine aid to a loan, confiscating Russian seized assets to fund Ukrainian reconstruction, and removing Biden's pause on LNG exports. Despite the Speaker's best bipartisan efforts, many Republicans remain unsatisfied, including McCarthy ouster Marjorie Taylor Greene, who had the following words for Johnson. Everywhere I go in my district, everyone is so angry at Mike Johnson. And one guy said it to me like this. He goes, do they have Mike Johnson's wife tied up somewhere and have a gun to her head? What is wrong with Mike Johnson? So for Mike Johnson to actually think that his Republican conference supports sending $60 billion to Ukraine, he is a damn fool, Steve. Hold, hold, and and he's, hold, he's a liar. Hold, hold, hang on. We seem to be talking about ousting a speaker a lot on talking points this past year. You know, Marjorie Taylor Greene is the one backing this up this time. Is there any smoke behind the fire? 
Yeah, I mean, she's one of the only ones backing this. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, filed a motion back in March to oust Johnson, and that's yet to be called upon for a vote by Johnson himself. Um, the House will consider that vote in the next two legislative days. I mean, it would need a majority vote to pass, or more likely they'll have a motion to table the resolution, effectively leaving it dead in the water, and that would only require a simple majority. Uh, but the GOP is still reliant on Johnson. We saw Bob Good from the Freedom Caucus Party coming out and asking for Johnson's nomination. This is the same Bob Good that took $2 million from McCarthy back for his 2020 re-election campaign and then threw McCarthy overboard when it came time to vote him out as speaker. The same um, Bob Good that said, uh, he declined whether he was going to support Green's move to Alice Johnson or not. So just speaking to the GOP infighting that we're seeing right now, unlike Democrats who seem to have control and loyalty behind uh, Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries. All right, so all that being said, how secure is Johnson, Johnson's position as a speaker? Is history going to repeat itself? Is, is the House majority not going to have a leader? Yeah, I mean, Johnson seems to be okay on the green front. We saw Representative Mike Turner say he's confident Johnson's not a significant risk. We even saw Florida Representative Matt Gates say that removing Johnson wouldn't be a wise decision. Um, but still, we have a lot of Republicans privately conceding that they may not win their re-election campaigns come fall. Um, and if they don't, Democrats would take control of the House and Johnson would be uh, ousted as Speaker and Hakeem Jeffries would take the gavel. So something we're definitely going to keep an eye on um, as he weighs those risks, yes, of Marjorie Taylor Greene, but moreover, considering those re-election campaigns in the fall. Ben, thank you. And now to the 2024 election and the presidential campaign making headlines in an unusual place. The state of Nebraska could play a big role in all of that important race to 270. Our Luke Radel is in studio tonight to help us preview the possible math to a Trump-Biden tie. Luke, good evening. Ben and Olivia, good evening. Ready for another installment of our series, The Race to 270. Let's remember what happened four short years ago in 2020 when Joe Biden and Donald Trump faced off. The final tally, 306 electoral votes to 232. But of course, remember, with the census, with reapportionment, those numbers shifted a little bit. So if the race was rerun all over again and they won the same states, it'd be 303 to 235. With that math in mind, let's take a little bit of history here. All of the states in the Electoral College are what is known as winner-take-all states, where if you win the majority of the votes there, you get all of the electoral votes, with two very important exceptions, Maine and Nebraska. Now, Nebraska is where we're looking at those headlines out about Trump and his GOP allies trying to change Nebraska from a state that apportions its Electoral College votes by congressional district to one that is winner-take-all, like the other 48 in the constitutional U.S. Now. What would that mean for the electoral math? Well, let's remember that Joe Biden pulled off a win in Nebraska's second congressional district with 56% of the vote. He was the only candidate to split Nebraska's electoral votes with the exception of his former boss, Barack Obama, back in 2008. Now, that win in that little tiny portion of Nebraska earned Joe Biden one electoral vote, which he was able to use in his overall tally back in 2020. So let's look at the math here and see how things could shake out in 2024. We're always looking at those battleground states, battleground states like Arizona, that if Donald Trump flipped, the math would go to 292 to 246. Let's talk about Nevada, another state that could flip there in the Sun Belt. Math goes to 286 to 252. Now, let's look at one more state along that Sun Belt route, Georgia, a state that was very close in 2020 and led to Donald Trump being indicted to try and overturn those results. If he is able to overturn it this time at the ballot box in 2024, look at that, 270 to 268, meaning if we get rid of that little portion there of Nebraska, we have a 269 to 269 tie, a really weird constitutional quirk there of our system. So what would happen if there was a presidential tie? We would all be in hell. No, I'm just kidding. It would be even worse than that. A vote would happen in the United States House of Representatives to determine who the president is going to be. Each one of the states would have their own delegation to cast votes. They talk about it a lot in Hamilton. The election of 1800 was the only other one to end up in a tie. So I'll, I'll leave you to Lin-Manuel and send it back over to you, Olivia and Ben. Great, thank you. Coming up on Talking Points, abortion rights supporters in Florida have been on a hot winning streak in the state ballot initiatives. How the recent Supreme Court cases could impact health care in the state. I see you mobbing over her. Let's go. Let's mob. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. Hey, yo, we mobbing. Come on, girl. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. Ayo, let's crawl. Ayo, let's crawl. Ayo, let's crawl. Ayo, let's crawl. Look at you. You're at the top of your game. You're unstoppable. Nothing can throw you off track. Wait, is that your car? Uh oh. 
Yeah, I saw that coming. That will throw you off track. You're looking at around 10 grand in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Let's try this again. Smart move. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. You quit smoking and thought, that's that. But here's the thing about lung cancer. By the time you see the symptoms, it could be too late. But now, there's a new scan that can detect lung cancer early, when it's more curable. If you smoked, get scanned. Talk to your doctor or learn more at savedbythescan.org. Welcome back into Talking Points. Potential fallout from Florida's looming six-week abortion ban is likely to echo across the entire country. The court has ruled to uphold its current 15-week ban, allowing a six-week ban to take place on May 1st. This will shut off abortion access in the South, where neighboring states already enforce near-total bans. Here to tell us how the state is reacting is Talking Points analyst Megan Acker. Megan? That's right, guys. The Florida Supreme Court recently issued twin decisions on abortion that are rocking the state, leaving politicians from both sides of the aisle scrambling. The court determined that a six-week abortion ban could go into place as early as May 1st, which is a major victory for Republican legislators, many of whom have maintained hardline support for such restrictions. Democrats, on the other hand, have raised concerns about the bill, claiming that the decision violates the privacy rights guaranteed by the state's constitution. The right to procure an abortion is protected expressly by the Florida State Constitution up until the end of the first trimester, stating that, quote, the state's interest becomes compelling upon viability, end quote. The six-week ban prevents abortions considerably before conventionally defined viability, with the only exceptions being for cases of rape or incest. However, the Florida Supreme Court simultaneously ruled to allow a bill to go up to ballot this November, which would enshrine abortion access in the state's constitution. It essentially reinforces the language already present in the Constitution, guaranteeing that no law shall prohibit, penalize, delay, or restrict abortion before viability or when necessary to protect the patient's health as determined by the patient's health care provider. If this referendum is passed, it would effectively repeal the six-week ban. In order to be incorporated into the state's Constitution, the bill must pass by a 60% majority, which, despite being a supermajority benchmark, is possible. Abortion access is a topic that seems to be becoming relatively less bipartisan across the country, with polling from Pew Research showing that as of 2022, 61% of Americans support legalized abortion access. Additionally, polls conducted by the University of North Florida indicate that 62% of respondents would vote yes on the proposed referendum, which would be enough for the bill to pass. Now, earlier today, former President Donald Trump, who has wavered between highlighting and downplaying his role in decreasing abortion rights, came out this morning with his feelings on the issue. Take a listen. View is now that we have view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint. The states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law of the land. In this case the law of the state. Now this decision has thrown Florida Republicans into a tizzy. Many legislators have maintained hardline support for a complete or near complete abortion bans in the past, seeking to build a base with their further right constituents. In light of the court's decision, many Republicans are now scaling back and favoring a more centrist approach to the issue. This mimics the pattern seen nationwide in light of the unfavorable response many abortion restriction laws have, ha have received in red states such as the infamous Alabama IVF ruling that defined embryos as, quote, extrauterine children, end quote. This is all as the Republican majority continues to shrink in the House of Representatives, forcing a serious dilemma for current legislators as the November election draws nearer and they must take a definitive stance on exactly how far they are willing to go on the issue of abortion. Olivia and Ben, back to you. Megan Acker, thank you. And stick with the topic of elections, November's presidential election is just less than seven months away. The presumptive Republican nominee, Donald Trump, has been vetting some potential VP candidates, but nothing seems to be set in stone yet. 
Some of the criteria that Trump has reportedly been sticking in a running mate include strong loyalty and appealing to vital voter demographics. Here to walk us through some of Trump's potential candidates and who exactly they are is Talking Points analyst Ethan Kraut. Ethan? Olivia, thank you. Trump obviously has many potential VP picks. So tonight, let's take a look at these four, starting off with Senator Tim Scott, the junior senator from, uh, from South Carolina. Now, Scott suspended his presidential campaign back in November. Scott appeals to many different vo uh, to many voter demographics, especially voters of color and younger voters, two key demographic groups that will end up deciding this upcoming election. Now, one thing to mention is Scott is a strong pro-life believer. As you just heard, Trump has been wavering back and forth, trying not to take too strong of a stance either way on the issue of abortion. So if Scott is picked as his running mate, it will be interesting to see how Trump addresses the issue. Let's take a look now at Representative Elise Stefanik. She represents New York's 21st Congressional District and is the chair of the House GOP Conference. Now, Stefanik was the first member of Congress to endorse Trump in this 2024 election cycle. She also appeals to younger voters like Scott, but as well as woman voters, another key gr group in this upcoming election. Now let's move over to Ohio and take a look at Senator J.D. Vance. Vance is one of Trump's most outspoken defenders in Congress. He too, like Scott and Stefanik, appeals to the younger voter demographic and also he supports Trump's quote unquote America first is foreign policy agenda, which among other things cut, will cut aid money to Ukraine. It will be interesting to see how voters will react to such a, uh, to cutting aid as it is a very controversial. Finally, let's go over to Florida and take a look at Senator Marco Rubio. He is, as I said, from Florida, the senior senator. He appeals to a different group. He appeals to Latino voters and Floridians. And albeit Florida has been more and more red in the past elections, it still is a swing state, and Trump can use any help he can get. There are some constitutional hurdles that will, will face uh, Rubio, as the Constitution states that the president and vice president cannot be from the same state, so one of them would have to change their residency. And another issue is he ran against Trump in the 2016 Republican primary, a primary that was brutal, with uh, Rubio making statements like this. Take a listen. Then he asked for a full-length mirror. I don't know why, because the podium goes up to here, but he wanted a full-length mirror. <laughs> Maybe to make sure his pants weren't wet. I don't know. <laughs> then, you all have friends. You all have friends that are thinking about voting for Donald Trump. Friends, do not let friends vote for con artists. And thank you. Coming up on Talking Points, the United States is awaiting Netanyahu's response after Biden's ultimatum. How this could affect the outcome of the war. Let's go see your room. What do you think? We kept it a little spare, so you can decorate it how you like. Dinner! Hello? Excellent. Soccer, soccer. Yeah, I saw you guys out there. Welcome to my house. Everybody's pretty tired of each other. The walls were closing in. Clearly a case of too much family, too close, 24 seven. If this sounds like your house, try going someplace new. Yourlifeyourvoice.org. You'll find lots of ideas to help you handle the family stresses of being confined to close quarters. Yourlifeyourvoice.org. It could help you find a little more Welcome back to Talking Points. We're going to shift now to the Middle East. 
The war between Israel and Hamas has been raging on as it reached its six-month mark yesterday. Israel has been very reliant on U.S. aid throughout the war, but recent events have caused a deadlock between Israeli and U.S. leaders. Our analyst Alex Burstein joins us in studio. Alex, are U.S.-Israel relations fading? Yeah, it's not very clear right now, Olivia. For over 70 years, Israel and the United States have been one of the strongest alliances. Washington is far and away the biggest provider of weapons and security to Israel, but it seems now support may be becoming conditional. Last Wednesday, U.S. President Joe Biden and Israeli President Benjamin Netanyahu had a nearly 30-minute phone call. This came after Israeli strikes killed seven aid workers in Gaza a week ago. And Biden made clear future U.S. support will come based on how Israel treats Gaza. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken described the contents of the call to reporters last week. Right now, there is no higher priority in Gaza than protecting civilians, surging humanitarian assistance, and ensuring the security of those who provide it. Israel must meet this moment. The U.S. has been in a particularly sticky situation recently with Israel. Since the Hamas attacks, the U.S. has been supplying weapons to Israel, and they have continued to do so up until this point. But leaders from around the globe have become frustrated with the incessant fighting. Last month, the U.S. allowed a ceasefire resolution to be passed in the U.N., which angered Israeli leaders. The biggest hurdle may have been created this past week, though, when Israel struck and killed Iranian leaders in Syria. Top U.S. officials fear Iran could retaliate. Throughout the whole conflict, the U.S. has tried to avoid the war from spreading regionally. As you see here, throughout the past couple of months, the U.S. has sent money to Israel on multiple different occasions, and they seem to continue doing so with as much as $2.5 billion in weapons just a couple of weeks ago, but a lot of uncertainty after this recent call that remains to be seen. the phone call you mentioned earlier in the segment between Biden and Netanyahu. What exactly took place during that phone call? Yeah, so they were talking about what happened in Gaza recently this past week, and they knew that there were some Iranian attacks coming up most likely as Iran has threatened, as you mentioned, that retaliation. And Israel obviously very reliant on the U.S. aid, so they said that they are going to open up two, two new uh, ports for aid to come into Gaza. And actually today, it was the day that there was the most aid that went into Gaza, over 400 trucks worth of aid into the area since the start of the war. Israel also withdrew all troops from the southern part of Gaza. So today was the first day in a while that there was no active fighting in Gaza. I mean, still every day there seems to be rapid advancements happening in the war, including a rejection of ceasefire. That was just today. Can you tell us if this changes anything? Yeah, nothing is changing at the exact moment. These meetings have been going on in Egypt and Cairo, and there was some mixed reports about what came out of it. But basically, Hamas said that they're no closer to a deal. They are going to continue to negotiate over the next 48 hours, but there does not seem to be a lot of progress in those talks. Of more concern for Hamas is Netanyahu saying that he does have a date for a ground offensive in Rafah, one of the bigger cities in Gaza. So it seems like there could be a return to fighting in Gaza soon, and Rafa's been that big city circle that there could be big impacts for in the coming weeks. And now let's talk about, let's talk about the U.S. angle to the story. What are the possible political implications of this move for Biden? Yeah, it's very, very complicated for the Biden administration right now. They have had a lot of trouble negotiating this Israeli issue because there's a lot of voters on both sides that are pro-Israel and are against the current actions by Israel and the Democratic uh, side of things. You look at young voters, Muslim and Arab American voters, and the very far left. They are all against continuing to send aid to Israel. Biden all along throughout his administration and his political career has been staunchly pro-Israel, but he has put up some warning signs now with Netanyahu in the past week. And then we saw last Tuesday in Wisconsin, over 50, nearly 50,000 voters on the Democratic side voted unidentified so that they would not have to cast a vote for Biden. Thank you. Coming up next on Talking Points, the Supreme Court has been slipping behind pace compared to last year. How this could have an impact on, ele on election-altering cases.
just a bottle. That no one would ever notice me. But I knew I could be more. That one day, I would make people smile. What's this? That's my resignation letter. You're resigning? Why? Because you're constantly ignoring me. You're half as active as you used to be, and you get stuff like this. You've been putting me under a lot of pressure lately. That's why I'm ready to quit. I, I forgot. I'll, I'll do better. Please, don't quit on me. OK, but remember, it's not what you say. It's what you do. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Let's go for a walk. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. <laughs> Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for information on how to provide even better care for the person who wants to care of you. Welcome back to Talking Points. Let's wrap tonight with a discussion on the Supreme Court. There are a lot of unsolved cases this term, unresolved cases, I should say, with only a couple months until it ends. Yeah, a lot of these cases could affect election turnout, too. According to Empirical SCOTUS, the court has issued opinions in just 22% of argued cases this year. That number was 34% through mid-April of 2022 in that year's term and 46% the year prior. Let's bring in Talking Boys anchors Sula Casciadelli and Erica Love now to talk about what the holdup is. And, you know, we've been talking about this holdup the last couple of weeks here on Talking Points. What cases is the Supreme Court talking about this session and what's really behind the holdup here? I mean, there's a lot of different issues on the table right now. We've got abortion in various states. We've got immigration down in Texas, Biden specifically targeting certain laws down there. And then we've also got the death penalty in Georgia, which has been in the works for a really long time. There's a lot of different things that are changing within these minute communities across Georgia. And then, of course, like I said, abortion covering multiple states and women's health care. We're seeing that take over a lot of the conversation. Yeah, and Erica, again, on abortion, talking about the Biden and the Idaho case about whether people hospitals must perform abortion when the health of a pregnant woman is uh, threatened here. And then also Mifepristone, we're talking about that too. But also some of these other cases, we're, again, we keep on talking about Donald Trump and a lot of the election subversion um, trials and cases that we're seeing, um, his immunity claims still yet to be decided by the court. And also control over social media platforms like we've seen in Texas and Florida. There's a lot on the docket here and also a lot that has to really do with a lot of people's lives to the point where we can see the effects from this start to um, take place once we see these decisions rendered. Yeah, you know, you were just talking about what's going on with TikTok that's really been in the media a lot lately, mm -hmm. and, and it's whether Texas and Florida can decide whether they have control over their social media. Uh, what, what is that looking like in the Supreme Court arguments? Well, at the end of the day, right, a lot of this comes down to ideology. The court is a lot more conservative than it's ever been in the past, even though we have a Democratic administration in place right now. It's being passed back and forth. A lot of people on the Democratic side are saying that they don't always see the power in the Supreme Court, but we're seeing the power of the Supreme Court, especially after last summer with affirmative action and uh, votes on student loans. So there's so many issues on the table, and the ideologies keep bouncing the conversation back and forth. And I think in our lives, I don't think we've seen it this stark, right? It almost seems like every single decision that comes, comes down is almost in this kind of 6-3 fashion that we continue to see. Um, and we wonder, though, at the same time, I think it's interesting to think about it, whether the stark ideological differences between the liberals and the conservative, conservatives rather on the court are to blame for this. You think it would be easier because everybody's voting on party lines, but I do genuinely think the court is trying to weigh these issues. But again, they just think so differently on an ideological term that it's just, it, sometimes it looks like it's taking a long time. To get we it. also have to think about the fact that there's a long summer ahead, right? Yeah. They've scheduled 62 cases so far. They average 100 to 150 every year. So there's so many different issues that can pop up, especially with elections coming up. And so many things, too, get perked up when talking about how many things are nationalized already. I mean, a few years ago, I felt like we, we, we as a country were having a conversation about um, 
executive orders coming down from the president and everything was being legislated through that manner. It now seems that we're also seeing that with the courts as well. Every single thing has to go up to the Supreme Court nowadays. And we'll see the conversation there tonight. Chilla Costi, Adele, Erica Love, thank you for joining us this evening. And that's all the time we have for you on this episode of Talking Points. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citrus TV News and like us on Facebook. I'm Benjamin Schiller. And I'm Olivia Maniscalco. Have a great night, Syracuse.